Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for giving us the gift that you have given to us. We take none of those gifts for granted. On my mind right now is the Lord's day. The day that we call yours, but you give it to us to worship you. You are amazing and good, God. Help us now to fully enter in. Even through the medium of video, help us to fully enter in. We worship you. Your grace is amazing. Happy Lord's Day, everybody. Let's worship together. Let's worship his amazing grace that allows us to gather across the distances. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears revealed. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy on it. One more time. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy is on My 
hope is built on nothing less. It's our confession here. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, this weak made strong in the Savior's love through the Seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Let's take it up. My anchor holds within. to grovel, but on the day, on that day, to stand, to stand faultless, absolutely perfectly clothed in your righteousness alone, King Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you for accomplishing this. Father, thank you for receiving this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
From there he shall come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the fellowship of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Normally during this time, we have a time of celebrating getting together. And that is something really to celebrate as we look forward to next week where we, when we actually will get together in this room to worship. That's exciting. And it is also exciting and significant because next week is our ninth year anniversary. This is the ninth year of the birth of this local church, the house. And so it is significant that on our ninth year anniversary, we get to be back inside the building and worshiping. But we're still under pandemic guidelines, and so we're not going to celebrate in a huge form. I mean, we don't have any gifts or food to give out to you. As a matter of fact, there is no food fellowship time afterward this time. But let's look forward to our 10th year anniversary. Uh, Lord willing, we will really celebrate before him and just celebrate his faithfulness. And we are celebrating his faithfulness by getting together. But let me give you some guidelines. First of all, hand sanitizing when you come to church. Hand sanitizing is a must, and it, it, and it will be provided for you. And second, temperatures will be checked at the door. And when you look at the, your, your temperature there, and if it's, it does not pass muster, go ahead and voluntarily go back home, which uh, is fine. No judgment whatsoever. You know, please, uh, for your own safety and the safety of others, go ahead and do that. When you come in, the Lord's Supper elements will be prepared for you. We will be having the Lord's Supper, praise God. But they are individually packed elements, and they will be prepared back there for you, along with the programs. The programs and the elements will be prepared way ahead of time, so there will be no risk of contamination regarding them. You just, as you come in, pick them up and go to your seats. And when you do go to your seats, you will be sitting six feet apart. Gauge that. That's at least three seats from one another. Okay? Six feet apart. At least three, maybe even four, apart from one another. Families are welcome to sit together because they've been living together anyway. And so six feet apart. If there's not enough room in the chapel, then there should be enough room. But if not, then right outside in the fellowship hall, you'll be able to worship there as well. But six feet apart. And as you do that, masks are a must. You must wear a mask inside at all times. I will not be wearing a mask, but let me tell you, let me go on record. I've been healthy throughout the entire time. By God's grace, I didn't even catch a cold this entire time. And so I'm very grateful for that and, and happy to report it. And so I will not be wearing a mask, but everybody else should be inside the building. There will be no lunch fellowship afterward, like I mentioned a little bit earlier. Let's save that for a little bit later. And we will go home directly after the worship service. That means no fellowship time in the back or uh, out in the parking lot. Just we go home. <laughs> we go home directly. Okay? That's how it will be. Now, let me also say to those of you who would rather worship at home still, and this has been a blessing for you to have the video and things like this, and it's been a blessing for me, and if you, if you are not comfortable coming out to the worship service yet, if you have pre-existing conditions, as we've been talking about, or, or, or reasons, or any reason you feel uncomfortable about coming out to church, please do not feel any kind of guilt regarding that. You're doing it for your own safety and for others' safety, and that honors the Lord. You're doing that out of love. Feel free to stay at home because we will prepare the, uh, the worship through video as well. Though it won't be at 11.30. We'll be recording at that time. But by the evening, Lord willing, I'll do my best. We'll do my, our best to have it prepared for you so that in the evening you'll be able to worship via video uh, with the same worship service that, we, that your brothers and sisters fellowshiped and worshiped around that day. Make sense? Praise God. Looking forward to our first time together physically next week, our ninth year by God's grace, anniversary. What a wonderful faithfulness. And during these worship services, God has been faithfully providing the special song to offer up to him, and this week is no different. We have a brother-sister duo, Brother David Sung, as well as Jenny Sung, have prepared a special song for the special, special song offering, and afterward, our... Um, 
our pastor, uh, Pastor Karen, will come and pray on behalf of the worship service. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are the source of true and lasting joy. We praise you for your power is beyond compare. We worship you for your wisdom, which is beyond understanding. How, how great you are, Lord. King of kings, we love to sing praise to you. We rejoice in you, our maker. We exalt your name, our king. We praise your name for your delight in your people. We do not deserve to come into your presence of the Holy God, but you crown the humble with victory. You have clothed us in your righteousness. We come before you with confidence, not based on ourselves, but based on your love, Almighty God. Jesus Christ, we come and approach 
your throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Create in us a clean heart and give us a right spirit. Help us not to fall away from your presence and grieve not your Holy Spirit. Restore to us the joy of our salvation and uphold us with thy spirit. Today, as we obey your call, do not to forget meeting together. Help us to acknowledge to your presence. Rule this place. Empower your servant, Pastor Paul, as you deliver your word. Anoint him. Lead him. Use him powerfully and help your people to listen and obey. Father, please bring healing to those who are sick. We pray not only to their healing, but for them to be comforted while they heal. Father, please heal them inside and out and provide them the medical care they need. We also pray for those who are for, for, for the sick. Be their source of strength and protection as they nurse others back to health. Father God, we ask that this pandemic will end soon. And let there be peace in order to our nation. Be with, your, be, be with our country's leaders. Use them as an instrument of thy peace as they implement the law of the land. Father, I pray that the fellowship of our faith would become effective through the knowledge of every good thing you bestowed on us through our position in Christ. Bring much joy and comfort in the love we share and cause our fellowship to be source of sweet refreshment to our entire church family. Father, we thank you. And this is our prayer in the mighty name of our Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you to the Sung siblings as well as uh, Pastor Karen for your special song and prayer. Praise God for you. Today, the text comes from 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 24, the do's and the don'ts of the final days in a cave. Let me read this passage, and then we'll get right into, this, into the message today. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Interesting background to our story today. Let's pray. King Jesus, thank you for your fascinating word and drive it into our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. In your name, King Jesus. We pray, our shelter, as we meet under his wings, we meditate on this passage where David is inside of a cave. Now, the do's and don'ts of the final days in a cave. We're going to be looking at a story where David has been spending time sheltering in a cave. But that's how very much we feel right now. As far as this worship service goes, we have not been able to worship inside this room. We have been holed up in our homes. And many of you have not stepped foot outside of your home throughout this whole time. I don't think you, didn't, you needed to do that. But, so, but in any way, you've been literally living inside of a cave since the middle of March. I think it was March 15th since the last time uh, that we started uh, having this videoed worship service. So yeah, it's been a long time. 
And so some people have played with, you know, people, when they have some time on their hands, they get a little bit creative. And so they did something with a very famous painting, Mona Lisa, as you see. This is the, the, the painting of Mona Lisa, very famous, famous painting, famous woman. Uh, we really don't know, I don't think, who this woman really was. And so they pictured her with a mask during, the, during this pandemic season. They also pictured her, let's see, ah, with how she will be in the, in the process of the quarantine. As you see, uh, she, has, she now has, uh, has, has, what is that, split end? Not split end, what am I saying? The white hair growing out of her, her previously dyed hair. And that's a pretty good depiction. I think if, she, if Mona Lisa were to put on some makeup, but the hair, uh, you know, all of us are having a hard time getting to the hairdresser or anybody to give us a haircut, right? So that's probably unrealistic, but the white hair growing in in the middle, that really makes sense. Somebody else has pictured it this way. Let's put Mona Lisa up there one more time. And this is the Mona Lisa in March. Mona Lisa in March. That's Mona Lisa in April. And this is Mona Lisa. <laughs> of Mona Lisa in May. Uh, just frazzled and not knowing what to do. I think uh, that kind of depicts how a lot of us may be feeling at this point. So I thought that was pretty cute and pretty good. That's what living in a cave might do to you. So David at this time was going through, this is a little bit distracting. Yeah, let me just take that off for you real quick. <laughs> David at this time was going through a time of going from cave to cave what the Bible talks about, strongholds, strongholds, strongholds. These are caves up in the hills, hard to access, but from which vantage point you can see all around and see where the enemies might be coming from. Because David was being persecuted by an enemy, an enemy that wanted him dead. And the enemy was no one less than the king of his nation. King Saul was trying to kill David. And we think a few months is terrible to be a hold up inside of a cave. Well, David was being persecuted, being chased down for a space of about 10 years. We don't know exactly the amount of years, but about 10 years or so, he has been, being, he was, has been chased by Saul. And throughout that time, he had been in several different kind of caves, hiding for his life. And we see that story. And this is one of those instances that we are looking at here. So we who have been hiding out in our caves, in our personal caves, can relate to, with David as he goes through these, this struggle, this, this, this time of being persecuted. And so I want to give you just three points today, just three. I know I went crazy last week with a whole bunch of different points and spelling out different things. So this week, I only want to give you three. And one is what to do. Do trust. Don't panic and write a song. Do trust in the Lord. Don't panic and do write a song. Reflecting on David's life, seeing through the lens of who Jesus is, we'll be able to apply what is going on here to our present situation. Got it? Those kind of three foci we'll be looking at as we look through each point. First, when in the final days of being in a cave, right? It looks like the guidelines are being lifted and we might be able to return to some level of normalcy, albeit through phases. So it's pretty exciting. It's pretty good. But in these final days of being cooped up, we can get a little bit desperate and, uh, and frazzled, as we saw a little bit earlier. What to do, what not to do. First of all, do trust. Take a look at this. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, all your ways, all, every single one of your ways, acknowledge him. And here's the promise. He will direct your paths. He will make your paths straight. According to a few different versions being put together, a very famous, famous passage, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 David, King David, is living this out beautifully. Look at verse 15. He finally is confronted with, with Saul. 
Saul has found him in the cave. But you know how he found him? Very interesting story. Saul had come with 3,000 men to attack David and kill him and all of his men. All of his men had been hiding out inside these caves, in the recesses of the caves. If you look at the pictures of these caves, they, a lot of them are just very intricate systems, and they open up into these huge cavernous rooms, big rooms. And, and so Saul had gone into one of these rooms to go to the bathroom, to relieve himself. The Bible says that. And David and his men were in the dark parts deep in the cave. They were able to see that King Saul had come in. One of them actually told David, God has given your enemy into your hand. Now you go and kill him. David went to Saul, but instead of putting a knife in Saul's back or in his chest, he took it and cut off a piece of his garment and went back. And King David, not king yet, but in a kingly fashion, he calls out to Saul and says, Saul, King Saul, I could have killed you today, but there's no way that I'm going to put my hand out against someone that God has set aside, that God has established, that God in his wisdom has put in place as the king of the the people of Israel, as God's servant. There's no way I'm going to touch you. Look at the way the beautiful way David trusts. May the Lord therefore be judge, verse 15, and give sentence between me and you. See to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. I am leaving all the judgment in the Father's hands, in God's hand, and may he deliver me and may he judge between you and me. You see how David is just leaning in and leaning in and leaning in. He, according to his own own, um, planning and imagination and timing, somebody was saying, God gave him into your hand. And so David could have killed Saul, thinking that he's doing God's will, but he knows God's will. He knows what God has revealed to him, and he knows that it would be sin for him to kill King Saul. So he refuses to do it. He refuses to take matters into his own hands, relying completely on the Lord. And in this way, he is very much like our Lord, like God. He's a man after God's own heart. Jesus displays God's heart perfectly. Jesus is God in the flesh, and Jesus is faithful. Jesus trusts the Father like nobody else ever did. When there was absolute silence, he still trusted. When Pilate was beating him to a pope, he did not retaliate. When Pilate claimed that he had the power to kill him, Jesus refuses to acknowledge that power as being Pilate's power, but he acknowledges that that power was given to him by his heavenly Father, and Jesus is okay with that. God has set these circumstances. God has set these wheels in motion. And God is controlling every turn of those wheels. And Jesus is okay with that. He's going to embrace that sovereignty. He's going to embrace that providence and that plan. Because he knows God's loving hand is in it all. He doesn't shake. He doesn't waver. I ask you and me today. What do we trust in the cave? What do you trust? What do I trust? There are all kinds of temptations to trust in different things. Why are we so afraid? Or why are we hold up? We do this to preserve our lives, and rightly so. We should, as good stewards, take care of our lives and the lives of those around us, of this nation and of this world. We should care about the lives, especially made in God's likeness, as well as the rest of creation. We should. But when we are taking matters into our own hands and thinking that we are determining our future and determining whether or not we live or die, we make a mistake. We delude ourselves into thinking that we have the kind of power we do not really have. Life and death and everything else in between are in our Heavenly Father's hands. Very interestingly also, what are we tempted to trust? 
I find this to be more true in my life than I'd like to admit. We trust in money, don't we? It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Our pieces of money say what? In God we trust. (laughs) In God we trust. And yet the Bible makes it clear, one of the biggest temptations, biggest temptations for idolatry is money. It's money. That's what Jesus says. You can't serve God and money at the same time. The idea of serving, loving, giving service to, being tied to, being covenanted to, God or money. You can't be, can't be both. If it's money, you're going to try to use God to support money. If it's God, you will use money to be subservient to God. That's where you need to be. In God we trust. This is an opportunity, loved ones, to really look into our hearts while we have been set aside, while we have been quarantined, while we have been set away from all these things. Some of us are going to be seeing our bank accounts dwindle. Some of us, your sources of income, you had already been living day to day, month to month, and now the sources of income are gone, and you don't know really what to do. This is an opportunity to lean into the Lord and to find out that the Lord is all that you need, ultimately speaking, that money has not really been your shelter. I know this is a hard thing for me to be saying to you if you are enduring it, but please, I know it may be a very hard lesson, a very big pill to swallow, but in the middle of the economic chaos, and this world is in an economic chaos, we have an opportunity to remember that God is our shelter and stability. He is our only and ultimate trust. So do trust. Take this opportunity to trust in God in ways you never have before. As it shows up right now, this pandemic is going to be showing up all kinds of tendencies toward trusting other things than God. And as they pop up in your meditation and thinking, as you are meditating in your cave, lay every idol down. Whether that was health, wealth, or any other form of success, you have an opportunity to lay it down. Second, I would challenge you, don't panic. Don't panic. When you look at uh, David's life, of his wandering in the wilderness like this, you see him panicking. Almost never, but you see him panicking. There is an instance of his panic. Look at this. In, verse, in chapter 27, verse 1, He's still being chased by Saul. David said, then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day at the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. The brilliant plan that David hatches in his panic that he may lose his life is I will go to the Philistines. I will go to the people of Goliath (laughs) and find safety there. For all intents and purposes, he is now cutting ties with the people of Israel. Yes, he will retain ties, and yes, God will bring it about at the end where David ultimately becomes king of Israel, but that is by the sheer special grace of God. In fact, because of David's panicky choice here, he basically becomes an enemy of the people of Israel and gets himself in a corner where he's going to be forced to fight and kill his fellow Israelites had God not intervened and made it made it so that David did not sin like this against the people of Israel. Purely by God's special grace was David preserved from the disastrous, catastrophic circumstances, inevitable circumstances, because of his panicky decision. When you look at Jesus' life, though, what you find is Jesus is sad, Jesus is angry, and Jesus is joyful, but he's never panicky. 
He's never panicky. You say, Pastor Paul, I remember. I remember Jesus went into the temple. He made a cord of whips or something and started whipping everybody and pushing everybody out. That looks pretty out of control, panicky to me. From what I read from the scriptures, though, that was absolutely planned and calculated. Sure, absolutely honest and honest anger, wrath, righteous anger. He had gone a day ahead to check out the temple. And after he had checked it out, he knew what he had to do. And deliberately, he went in and put the wrath of God against inequality, against sin, against selfishness, against pride, against racism. He put it all out there. He displayed God's beauty. Beautiful anger against sin. Jesus is never panicky. If there was anybody who was cool, Jesus was always cool. There is nobody more cool than Jesus. There was, a, well, there was an instant. An uncool father comes to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, please, please come and heal my daughter. She's about to die. She's on her deathbed. Jesus, Jesus, I'll go and heal her. Jesus is following this panicky father, and on the way, he meets a woman who had touched the hem of his garment, touched the hem of his garment, and had been made whole. He stops the whole proceeding and pauses to make her completely whole. Not only is she healed of her her flow of blood, of many, many years, but he restores her to the community. He restores her on every level, relationship with God. Jesus is beautiful, and Jesus is cool. He's not panicky. In the face of death itself, he is not panicky. The only place where he comes close to panicky, where he comes close to losing it, is the, only, is the proper place on his knees as he pours out his heart before the heavenly father in the garden of Gethsemane. When we are stressed, when we are in this cave, how are you going to spend the final days of being in this cave? Don't panic. It is the worst place to make decisions that will impact your life for the rest of your life under the pressure of being in a cave of peril. Under the pressures that are all around you in the constantly, constantly shifting, shifting you know, circumstances, those are the worst places for you to make decisions that you will have to face for the rest of your life. We do all kinds of silly things when we are under pressure, don't we? I think of a very silly situation. When we get panicky, we do silly things. I, I think about the story that I've heard of a person who is smoking, right? He is smoking a cigarette, and he meets his pastor on the street, and he knows he's not supposed to be smoking a cigarette, so he hides it behind his back. And the pastor sees that funny scene. It's not like he can't smell the cigarette. He's got smoke coming out the top of his head. Or in some cases, I've heard that this actually happens. The person will see the pastor coming, take that cigarette, put it in his pocket. That particular pastor said that he stood there just to see how long this guy (laughs) would endure having the lit cigarette in his pocket. We, We make Really silly decisions. We don't think well when there is pressure all around us within the confines of a cave in general. And when we panic within that confines, when we, within those confines, when we are claustrophobic, those are the worst times to make decisions. So don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. Trust. Don't panic. And finally... Write a song. That's what David did. David. Remember the song that we went over last week? This song that we, said, that we went over last week, Psalm 57. Psalm 57. 
Uh, we, we, I, I gave you all of those acrostics, Savior, the four H's, right? The Savior, uh, secure. Jesus' wings are secure. Jesus' wings are accessible. Jesus' wings are inviting. They are victorious. They are omnipotent. They are refreshing. All of that, right? And I said that the only way to respond living under those wings is to, to respond honestly before God, to hope in his deliverance. What else did I say? What were the other two H's? I have, a, I have a listed here. And to holler at the storm of your life and to sing hallelujah, right? The Savior and the four H's, all of those things come from Psalm 57, which came from the time that David was in the caves. <laughs> he was in the caves of a place called Adullam. And he is in the caves here of En Gedi when he was fleeing for his life from Saul. And in those moments of desperation, he experiences the deliverance of God and he writes a song. A song that we are singing about today. The songs that we are singing today. The very words that we are offering up to God today come from times of a pressurized condition of being inside of a cave. While you still have that opportunity, I would encourage you right now, spend that time to write a song to the Lord. You may not be musically gifted. I'm not talking about really, I'm speaking kind of metaphorically. Write down something that you will remember in the future. Write down, record it. If you don't really write, then record it. Or do something. Do something to remember God's faithfulness to you in the middle of your wilderness journey, in the middle of your going through this pandemic, in the middle of your pressurized condition within the walls of this cave. Write it down. Remember it. And as you do it, you may find yourself in a place where, it is, where the walls of your cave are not confining anymore. Rather, it is in the walls of, the, of that cave that you experience God in a way that you have never done before. And in that cave, you can write a love song to God. And you can write a love song that you will treasure. And you can write a love song that you will reflect on and draw strength from for the rest of your life. When I, when I said that you shouldn't panic in a, in a panic mode and make decisions like David did and almost mess everything up, I did not mean that even within the confines of the cave, I mean, the cave has a lot of potential for you to do a lot of self-reflection and reflecting on God. So in as much as you are given some time, some of you are given some time, some of you are more busy than you were before this pandemic began. But I'm speaking specifically, I've been saying this almost every week, to, to really not waste this time that you've got. Don't waste it on Frivolous things. Use this time to get to know God better. And as you get to know him better, put down a record. Whether that's a recording, whether that's something written in a journal, or whether that is a song carefully crafted, write it down. Remember God's faithfulness. The Bible says, sing a new song. What's the big deal about a new song? A new song is the song of what God is doing constantly new in your life. It is a record of your fellowship with God, of your growth in him, of your finding peace in the middle of impossible circumstances. Write the new song. Pastor Paul, you've been focusing on Jesus in every one of these points. How do you focus on him here? Jesus never wrote anything. Well, that's not completely true because he did write something on the ground. We don't know what that is. Remember that woman that was caught in adultery? That's true, though. He didn't write anything down. He had other people write it down, but he didn't write anything down. True. But let me give you this point then, and this is the one I close with. I think Jesus writes. He wrote the scriptures for us through his Holy Spirit. He's still writing. You know, I look at the book of Acts, and, the book, and it's called the Acts of the Apostles. But it begins by saying this, O Theophilus, the person to whom the book of Acts was written, 
The former account I wrote to you about Jesus and the things that he began to do. That's talking about Luke's gospel. So the gospel was written about what Jesus began to do. Acts was about what Jesus continued to do. And what Jesus continued to do through the Holy Spirit was to write his Bible. But somebody came up with a name for an organization for church planting, that is, starting new churches, and they called it Acts 29. The name itself is completely self-explanatory because the book of Acts, the record of what Jesus continued to do, has only 28 chapters. Acts 29 means he's still doing work, and I would add, he's still writing. Not special revelation. He's done with reading the Bi- writing the Bible. This is all the revelation of God, written revelation of God we need, and all that we need for life and godliness, all that we need to have fellowship with God. But he's still writing a testimony of himself, a new song in the lives of his sons and daughters. He writes on tablets of the heart in the lives that are transformed by his love. You are God's letter of love. Just as Jesus proclaimed the the God of love to us, you and I proclaim the God of love to the world. You are God's God's love letter written on tablets of flesh, of hearts. Somebody put it this way, each day you write the gospel by the things that you say and the things that you do. What then is that gospel? The gospel according to you. Somebody else put it, th- put it in another way. You will not be saved by your works. Make no mistake. You, your works cannot save you. You will not be saved by your works. But get this. Others will. Others will. You see, non-believers do not read the Bible. They read believers. They read the difference, the real difference that Jesus makes in the lives of believers. They read the different way in which a believer will face persecution, will face an illness, a pandemic. You, my loved ones, are the letter of God's love to the world. Often I say this, And if you are within the hearing of my voice and you don't believe in Jesus yet and you're still thinking about the claims of of Jesus, and you you may have many reasons why you don't believe, but you tell me, I need some visible evidence. You know what I would say to you? Look at Christians. Look at the difference that God makes in the lives of everyday people like you and me. As a matter of fact, Christians will be the first ones to tell you that they are sinful beyond imagination, that we are absolutely depraved, no better than anybody on death row had it not been for the grace of God. See what a change God makes in selfish, sinful, prideful people just like you. Look at the visible evidence. I would say. That's what I say to you if you're not a believer. Look at the way that we go out of our way for you. What makes that difference? Jesus does. Because he has written this letter in our hearts. But to every child of God, I would say, does that argument stand? Let it stand. If I say, look at the visible evidence, Let my statement have a reference point. Let my statement point to you and tell the truth. May the the world hear the love song that Jesus is writing in your life. You are Jesus' love song to his Father, carried on the wings of the heavenly dove, the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.
Lord, it seems like these are the last days that we are spending behind these closed doors. It is so important for us to know what to do and what not to do. In a world that is spinning so fast that we don't know which direction we'll land, we feel very much like that frazzled picture of the Mona Lisa in the beginning of this message. In this world, we don't understand. Help us to trust the one who does understand and has planned it all. Help us to trust in you. And in trusting you, help us to find our cool, Jesus' is cool. And not panic under these circumstances. And with that peace, that peace that passes forever, that, the peace that passes understanding that lasts forever, not as the world gives, but as Jesus gives. Teach us to sing. Let our lives sing of your beauty for all the world to hear and see. All for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
King Jesus. Within the confines of a cave, help us to find clarity of what really matters, of what's really precious. We trust not in riches. We trust not in fame. We trust not in worldly success. At least positionally, even though sometimes our hearts and heads don't follow, we trust only, ultimately, and love only you. With that heart in mind, and for that purpose, because where our treasure is, our hearts will be, we have laid down a bit of the treasure you've entrusted to us before you. These offerings are just tokens of our entire lives. We are, we are not saying if we offer you 5, 10, 20% that we've done our job. No, we're saying our 5, 10, 20% represents 100% of us. Because this is what it means to trust. And in doing this, Lord, when we see our bank accounts go down or the circumstances change, help us not to panic. And it'll help us all and help us always to proclaim your faithfulness in a song of joy. Accomplish this for your glory, we pray. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. In heaven, give us this day daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the unending, unfathomable love of God the Father Almighty, the oneness, the protection, the power, the peace, the presence of the Holy Spirit be upon every child of God this service reaches, be upon them both now and forevermore, for Jesus' sake and glory, amen.